Well, this talk also will be in honor of Alan Turing, uh, since this is his centenary, and so it seems very appropriate. Now, the talk is inspired largely by two papers of Turing that he wrote before, just before the war, before his work, famous work at Bletchley Park. Uh, the one that's most famous is this one here, on computable numbers, etc. Basically, the paper which is considered to be the origin, or one of the origins, of modern general purpose computers, because he was considering the, the notion of what a computation is, and this was what he was striving for, and he had an idea, a scheme for doing this, which differed somewhat from other logicians at the time, and the particular feature in which it particular way in which it differed is it was much clearer that it was what one meant by computation. There were other ideas like Church's ideas and Gödel's idea and so on. But Turing's, I should say there was another logician called Post who had a very similar idea to Turing. But the key thing that Turing introduced, which uh, you could say was the origin of the modern, modern general purpose computer, was the idea of a general, uh, the idea of a universal Turing machine. I'll, I'll say something about that shortly. But I'm going to be more, my talk is more perhaps inspired by the second paper here. Turing was certainly interested in the question of whether a uh, thinking by a human being could be explained as essentially the operation of a computer. So if you knew what a computer was, which is what he was introducing here, is that the sort of thing we do when we think, or is there something else involved? And I think at the time uh, when he well, between these two papers, he was considering the, the, that it probably there was something more going on in human thinking than could be explained by a computer. And the reason he thought that was to do with some things which I'll come to shortly. But after he was working at Bletchley Park and became very familiar with computers, I think he changed his mind and came around to the idea that uh, computers were so universal in what they could do that perhaps there was some way around the problems that he was introducing, pointing out here. So uh, the question is whether Turing was unhappy to model the mathematical mind as a universal Turing machine, that's the idea he introduced here, or was there something else beyond that? And, and in this paper here, he was trying to explore ideas which go beyond the idea of a normal computer. And there were two notions, uh, ordinal, ordinal Logics was one, one of the ideas, and oracles. I shall may say something about ordinal logics, but mainly I'll be talking about oracle machines. And so I'll try and explain uh, why one needs to, perhaps, to go beyond the idea of a computer in order to model the mathematical mind. So it's a different idea from what you've just been hearing in the previous talk. Let me first give you an example. This is a chess position. It's really one of a whole series of chess positions designed by William Hartston and David Norwood. And the idea was that you, it was a sort of Turing test. We heard about that this morning, uh, earlier today. Uh, the idea of a Turing test is can you distinguish the abilities of a computer from those of a human being? Could you tell which is the computer and which is the human being? And in this test, it was just chess problems. And half the problems were designed to be easy for human beings and hard for computers, and the other half were designed to be easy for computers and hard for human beings. And in fact, it was very clear. You could tell which were which easily. Now, this was some years ago, so I don't know whether the machines have got more sophisticated now uh, in this particular respect, but uh, let me explain just this particular problem here, which was a problem which was designed to be easy for humans and hard for computers. Now, you, if you look at this position, you see that uh, white, well, that's the brown pieces, uh, is supposed to draw the game. Black has a tremendous advantage of having uh, two extra rooks, um, and so it would be an overwhelming advantage if it were not for the fact that there is this barrier which is almost complete going across from one side of the board to the other. So the correct thing for white to do is simply put the bishop there, and then there is a, an impenetrable barrier between uh, one side and the other, and then he just has to run around on the back and there's no way of losing the game. Of course, if you gave this thing to any computer at that time, I've no idea now what would happen, uh, it would take the rook with the bishop, because that gives you a material advantage, uh, 
And what, what would the computer do? Well, it would compute move after move after move after move uh, to a certain depth and then try and judge whether the position had improved or not. And the thing is that it takes rather a long time to get beaten if, if you take the rook because these pieces have to work their way around and then pour their way through the hole and then checkmate the king. But that takes a long time, less, in a long time in the sense of a lot, a lot of moves, and so it's very difficult for the computer. Well, look, th this kind of position which is easy for the humans if you know anything really about chess. You just put the bishop there, and you can't lose. Uh, if you take the rook, that's, that's a disaster. Now, the thing is, chess is a finite game, and so that you certainly could have a computer which any kind of chess position would work out uh, how to win, if it was a win, or whatever it was, or draw in this case, uh, by simply trying move after move after move to as deep uh, as you need to go. So that if you want to see the, the, the sorts of distinctions that might be present in human thinking and computer operation, you have to think of things which are infinite. So, in fact, a Turing machine is a very clever device. It's infinite in one respect. It has an infinite storage space. You see, here you have the Turing machine itself, which is a finite object. It needn't be very big, in fact. And what is infinite is the potential of the storage space. So a Turing machine is an idealized computer, idealized in perhaps three respects. One is that it has an unlimited storage space. Another is that it never makes mistakes. And thirdly, it can go on for as long as you like without wearing out. So that's basically a Turing machine. Now that we know about computers, we don't have to de define what they are in terms of Turing machines. We can do it the other way around. So if you know what a computer is, a Turing machine is a general purpose computer with an unlimited storage space, never makes mistakes, and can go on without wearing out. But the, it's a potentially infinite thing. You will only always have a finite number of marks on these takes here. Uh, the rest of it will be blank. But by putting suitable marks on these tapes, you can make this Turing machine imitate any other operation, any other computation that you like. So any computation can be performed by this finite device. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about what a, a universal Turing machine is. But uh, I want to now to address which seems to me the crucial issue that was worrying Turing about whether uh, human thinking might actually be beyond these devices at the time when he was thinking that. Later on I'll indicate his, perhaps his way out, what he considered to be his way out. This is basically a form of Gödel's theorem. I'm going to present it in a rather different way from the way we had from Tim Gowers a little while, a little while ago. And I'll explain what, what the difference is here. Uh, I'm going to talk about r mathematical results about natural numbers. When I say a natural number, I just mean a number 0, 1, 2, 3, a whole number which is non-negative. And 0 counts as a natural number. And uh, the question is, suppose you have some theorem about natural numbers, and you might want to know if it's true or not, and you might have a, a, a method of, a, a system of rules which constitute a proof. Now, here's a, a key point, you see. Let's call these rules R. And the idea is that these rules, whatever they might be, are things that you trust. If you don't trust them, there's no point in regarding the result as a proof. So suppose uh, you had some rules which enable you to prove 2 equals 3. Well, clearly that's no good. You want to have rules that couldn't do that. How you know they couldn't do that, well, that's a subtle question. But if you're going to trust these rules, what Gödel shows, and this is really Turing's version of Gödel's theorem. It's, it's much easier to state, really. So Turing's version is the following, that if you have a set of mechanical theorem-proving rules which have the property that you can check com computationally whether they have been carried out correctly or not. So that's the key thing, that they are computational in the sense that they're computationally checkable. If you have such a set of rules which you trust to be correct and don't prove 2 equals 3, if you have that trust in them, then you can construct quite explicitly a specific statement about natural numbers, which I'm calling G of R. That's the Gödel statement, if you like, with respect to these rules. G of R, which on the same basis of your trust in R, you must believe is true. Yet, you cannot prove G of R using the rules. 
Now, you see, there's a, a subtle issue here about what, what one means by proof. And uh, Tim Gowers, in his talk, was, didn't really go into that. He said, so you have a proof. Uh, do you know a thing is true if you have a proof or if you don't have a proof? And there are certain things Gödel shows that you don't have a proof for. But the thing is, that the very way in which Gödel does show that there is no proof using those particular rules, it still has to be true. So the, the way you show that it's beyond the rules, at the same time, demonstrates it's true. Now, to me, although that's not a proof in this particular sense, it's still a proof because it's a, an utterly convincing argument on the basis of the validity or the trustworthiness of these rules, just as good as anything you could prove with the rules. You can't prove it with the rules, but you still can see it's true on the same basis that you trust the rules. Now, this is the remarkable thing which strikes me here and which uh, Tim didn't go into, which is that somehow the rules themselves, if you trust them, you can see how to go beyond those rules. And what Turing was trying to do in this, this extension of his uh, arguments that he was giving in his Turing machine paper um, was to go beyond that. I mean, are there ways in which you can... The, the ordinal logics, the idea was that if you have a set of rules, and it's quite a straightforward idea, if you like, so if you have a set of rules R, and then you can construct G of R, well, you know, if you trust R not to prove 2 equals 3, then you know G of R is true. So then you can adjoin G of R to your rules, and you have new improved rules, and then that tells you how to prove things that you didn't know before. And those tell you how to go G of that new system. And you can keep on going like that. And that idea of extending your systems in this way gave rise to Turing's idea of what he called an ordinal logic. Okay, well, that's... Uh, um, that idea. The other idea he had was something called an oracle, and I'll come to that uh, in a little while. But first of all, let me say something about the Gödel-type theorem. I'll give you a particular example. Now, here's an example uh, of a mathematical rule. It's very familiar to people uh, who you just sort of school mathematics. If you want to prove something with general statement about natural numbers, and let's call that P, where n is a natural number, p of n is some statement. It could be, say, that uh, um, if you take a sum of consecutive odd numbers, you get a square number, for example. And that would be a statement that would be true for any number n. Uh, you go up to, well, any, the nth odd number, if you like. And how do you prove that? Well, you could establish p of 0, and then you show that if p of n is true, then p of n plus 1 is true. You prove two things, and in proving two things you establish an infinite number of things. That's the remarkable thing that mathematical induction enables you to do. If you have just two things here that you can establish, and you've established an infinite number of things. So you can talk about the infinite in a perfectly finite way, which is what you do here. However, these are rules of the kind I was talking about in, in the earlier slide. And so there must be a Gödel statement which you can't prove using mathematical induction. So that's what Gödel tells us. Are these computational rules such as this sufficient? Well, often people tend to say, well, these statements are usually so fiendishly complicated that nobody will be interested in them anyway, so why bother with them? Well, that's not really true. And I want to give you an example of a statement which is a sort of Gödel statement for mathematical induction. You can't prove it using mathematical induction. I'm going to show you. It's a sort of cartoon-like thing. I'm going to show you here. Here we have Hercules and the Hydra. So here's Hercules. And you have to bear in mind, Hercules is tremendously persistent. He's very strong, and he, he'll go on. He's very determined. But he's not very brainy. That's, that's, uh, that'll come into what I say in a minute. Now, here is the Hydra. It's got lots of heads. And Hercules wants to try and kill the Hydra. The problem is that when he chops the head off, it grows some more heads. And there's a specific rule about how it does it. Now, here he's going to chop this head up, more or less randomly. He chops that head off. What is the rule? The rule is that you see where it's joined on, and then you see that part there. You go back down one, and then you grow another set just like this. Well, I've done it in cartoon form here. This first chop is here, and so you, when it's gone, you've got this bit. Go down to the bottom of that, and you grow another one. 
Next time he chops that one, and you get, it's twice. Instead of just one more, it does two more. The next time he chops something, it does three more, and then four more, and five more, and the number of heads just goes up and up and up and up enormously and goes to absolutely some huge number. Now, here's the theorem. This is the theorem due to Kirby and Paris. And the theorem says, no matter how incredibly stupid Hercules is, he always wins. And the number of heads that this hydra will go is absolutely stupendous. If you tried to work it out on your laptop or your mainframe, you'd ne get nowhere close. It's, it's just ridiculously enormous. However, that's not the point so much. The point is that you can't prove it using mathematical induction. And that's what Kirby and um, Paris showed. And in fact, they had a number of other examples, some of them a little bit easier to state than that, but uh, I thought it was quite a nice example to show. And how do you actually prove a thing like that? Well, you use some more refined kind of induction, which is called transfinite induction. I won't go into it, but you, you put ordinal numbers on these things. I, I'm not going to bother you with that argument. But you can prove it, but you have to go to the next level. And a way of going to another level is to use this girdle uh, Turin type of argument. You, this will tell you how to go to another level. But then you might have cleverer ways of doing it than just that. Okay. Now, what this seems to say is that whatever computational procedure you have for proving things, and you see, that's more or less the same as saying some set of rules. You see, a computational procedure is a, is a set of rules. If you have a set of rules for proving something, what Gödel shows, and what Turing shows with Gödel, is that those systems of rules are never going to be enough to prove the things that, using your insight and understanding, you can go beyond. So, I'll say a bit more about that later on. I do want to say a little bit technical here about... I, I shall rush through this probably because I think the technicalities are not so important. But I'm... You can get away with certain very simple types of statement. When I say simple types of statement, logically they're simple, but they can be very difficult things to prove. These are called pi-1 sentences. And uh, here's this just generalization of what a Turing machine was, if you like. And here are some examples. Fermat's last theorem is a good example. The Goldbach conjecture, which says every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers, still unproved. Uh, Lagrange's theorem that every number, every natural number is the sum of four square natural numbers. That was quite hard to prove. Lagrange could prove it, but I think it defeated Euler, so it was pretty difficult. Um, uh, the Fermat's last theorem is even harder to prove. It was only proved when Andrew Wiles was able to give his argument. The Goldbach conjecture is even harder than nobody's done it. But these are all examples of this pi-1 sentences. What is a pi-1 sentence? It's a statement that a certain Turing machine action never stops. And you can phrase all these mathematical statements in that form. You can say that you could do a computation and, and that computation will never stop. Well, the Fermat's last theorem would be a, a good example. You say, you try, uh, well, x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, and then you try all the different n's and z's and so on. And if that doesn't work, you try another one, then you try another one, and try another one, and try another one. And the statement is that that computation of looking for solutions will never end. So it's an example of a pi-1 sentence. Now, in fact, I am going to talk about more general statements called pi-n sentences. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about what they are. They're just logically slightly more complicated. A good example of a pi-2 sentence is the statement, again, I think, unproved, that there are an infinite number of prime pairs. That is, numbers where p is a prime and p plus 2 is also a prime. And there are an infinite many of those. Is that true or not? Nobody knows unless somebody... Unless I, I don't know it right and somebody's proved it recently, but I, as far as I know, it's still unproved. An easier one is the famous Euclid statement there's an infinite number of prime numbers. And that is proved, well, Euclid proved it, and uh, it's an example of a pi-2 sentence. So it's logically slightly more complicated. Let me not bother to go into that in any detail. I want to try and say uh, what a Turing oracle is, but I'm going to generalize it. You see, what, what was the idea of Turing's oracle? Well, you see, you can think of a computer and you have kind of subroutines and you can have a 
something where you might have already solved a certain problem, and so you feed in that, and you consult that at a certain time. But it's still a computational process. You might have a generalization of a computer, which is allowed to go and consult the oracle. Now, see, what is an oracle? Well, it's not anything we know how to build, but you just imagine you had something which could answer the truth or otherwise of a pi one sentence. So you ask it, is Fermat's last theorem true? And it might think for a while, so, yep, or no, you see. So a proper oracle in Turing sense would be one which would always say yes or no. Now, I thought of trying to think of a way of honoring Turing, thought that, well, maybe you can do something which is a bit more like a human being. Not perhaps like a human being or a human mathematician, but a bit more like it. It's allowed to say, uh, yes, I know, that's true. Or it's allowed to say, nope, that's not true. Or it's allowed to say, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. I'm sorry. Or it could say, sorry, don't bother me. I'm still thinking. Don't, I'm, I'm still working on it. Don't bother me. Come again tomorrow. Okay, so it's allowed to do those things. So it doesn't have to be an absolutely perfect oracle. It's a bit more like, more like a human mathematician. And uh, this is what I'm calling a... I hope I've got the right slide here. A cautious oracle, you see. That's the cautious oracle. And I've used this letter... Well, some places it's called pomega. It's really a, a form of a pi, but it looks more like an omega, so I make people call it a pomega. So I'll call it a pomega. And that's the letter I'm going to use for a cautious oracle. Now... These were, well, this was the idea Turing had. Uh, the notation I'm using here is if I have a proposition P, and if Pomega has a look at P, it's allowed to say T, that means, yep, it's true. Or it's allowed to say F, that means, nope, it's false. Or it's allowed to say, sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer, that's the question mark. Or this wiggles to infinity means, look, I'm still thinking about it. And that's the kind of generalized Turing machine I'm going to think about. Okay, so... We now have these operations. I'm going to call them Pomega devices. I, don't, I hate to use the word machine, because to me a machine is a computer-controlled or computer-controlled robot, something like that, which it has a, a computer, which is its control system, its brain, if you like. Uh, uh, but if it's not one of those things, I don't like calling it a machine. So we can call it a device. device. So this is a Pomega device, and this D stands for it, Okay. And so the, the thing is that you might consult this machine, this Pomega, from time to time, but apart from that, it's built like an ordinary computer or like a Turing machine. It just has this command. You can go and consult that thing every now and again you want to. And then it can have these possible outcomes too. The actual device might say utter truth eventually or falsehood, might say I don't know, or it might go on chugging away forever. Now, if you want to make statements and try and prove things about these things, you use the trick that Gödel introduced. This is the trick which enabled him to go beyond. He could show that any formal system you could, in a sense, go beyond. What is the trick? Well, it's Gödel listing or Gödel numbering. Gödel had a very complicated way of doing it, and you can actually do it much more simply. The basic thing is that if you have a... Um, one of these computing devices, a calculation or a number or a, any of things you might be talking about. You see, it could be a pi one sentence. It might be um, pi one sentence depends on numbers or all sorts of things. Or it might be a Turing machine action or it might be a Turing Pomega machine action. And all these things you can code in some way. So you can write down the code for it. And once you've written, written down a code for it, you can put that, those things in a sort of alphabetical order. Well, you do a little bit, not quite alphabetical order. What you do is you see how long the code is. You start with the short ones and then slightly longer, slightly longer, slightly longer. And within each length, you do it alphabetically. That's what's called lexicographical ordering. And that's basically what Gödel does. So that you codify all your machines, devices, whatever they are, as a number. And once you've done that, then you can start Gödelizing. Okay, well, I'm going to get the only thing I'm going to prove here is that theorem, which I started at the beginning, the Gödel-Turing theorem. So I'm going to give you a proof. Okay, I'm going to rattle through it, rather, not because it's, it's long and complicated, it's all on one transparency here, but because you have to sit and think about it, really. 
Okay, so here I'm going to do it in the original girdle turing version where we're going to try and see whether this set of rules, which is going to be a, an algorithmic procedure, uh, can answer particular pi-1 sentences. Are they true or not? Well, the question is whether some computation will go on forever. So that's the, a true pi-1 sentence is a sen computational which, which will go on forever. Okay. Now, suppose you had such a device which, given the, the, the girdle numbering of this computation, and that's C, and then you give an X, this thing also depends on the number X, that suppose you're given this computational thing that tells you that this is true if this does go on forever. Suppose you had one of those things. I think I've covered these. It helps a little bit if I move it down like this. Now, the first step is, I'm just going to fiddle with that machine slightly by saying it's not allowed to say um, false. It, if it said false, I'm going to step, put it into a loop. So well, given this original machine, I'm going to take a new one, which I'm calling E, the original R. These are the rules, if you like. The original one is E R. the new one is E. It only differs by the sense that it, it is only allowed to say true or else go into a loop. That is, it just never stops itself. That's a rather trivial, trivial modification, and I need that to make the proof work. Next step is you look at the number C here. You see, these are computations which depend on a number. So what I'm going to do is make uh, this x equal to C. And then now this is a computation which depends on just one number, and so that is one of the Cs. And so then you say, you look at the statement that you had before, which is given up here, or at least it's this one I'm looking at now, that if E of C and X, uh, it tells you it's true, this implies this computation goes on forever. If your computation uh, goes on forever, it sh sorry, if this thing says true, that means the computation does, does go on forever. But now I've got two Cs which are the same, so this is a computation depending on one number, so it's one of the Cs. So you see which one is, is H. So then you put uh, H of C, H is, is, the, is the, capital H is the H computation, and so you have the statement ECC equals E of H, H, sorry, H of C, and then you know this H of X is the H computation in Gödel's list, and so now you put C equals H, and then you see H, H, E of H, H equals H of H. Okay, now I put a star here, you have to think about that. Now you take C to be given by C equals H, that's what I said, and so then E applied to H, uh, if it tells you T, then H goes to infinity. But the A, E and H are the same thing. So that means that it wouldn't have said this, because if H goes to infinity, I'm afraid I've said this rather quickly, and you probably have to look at this thing and stare at it. But I think the main thing I want to show is that this is quite a compact argument. It uses twisted sort of logic, and you use the girdle numbering very crucially. Apart from that, you're, you're using this diagonal argument, which goes back to Cantor, a famous argument about showing that certain infinities are larger than others. It's really the same argument. And this shows you that this E, because if it did give you true, you would know since it's the same as H by that, it would have to go on forever. And since that would be, that's a contradiction. And so therefore it doesn't ever tell you truth. So you know that E must fail on this particular computation. So therefore, E can't access this conclusion, but we can see it's true by the argument I've just given you here. So the point is that by following this particular argument, you can see that there is no E, or there's no R, which can resolve this particular computation. So you construct the particular computation by this argument, which defeats R, but by the way you've done it, you can see that it, the statement is actually true, that it does go on forever. So if you could put Fermat's last theorem into such a statement, you'd have proved it. Even you, you'd have showed it wasn't outside the normal rules of logic, but you could still prove it this way. Anyway, that's a kind of contorted argument, but it's the way these things work. By using your understanding and insight, and Gödel's trick, if you like, you can show that there are certain statements lying outside the scope of the rules, 
which have the property that if you're prepared to use the rules as genuine proofs, that is, if you believe that those rules only give you truths, then you must also believe something outside the scope of those rules. Okay, well, this is actually a version of the original Turing argument. What I'm going to show you, I struggled over this thinking of trying to do it for the cautious oracle argument, and finally I realized it was the same argument. You just put this in, and now this is a statement that you can always defeat. The cautious oracles incorporated into the computer still don't give us something that we can see ourselves. I mean, when I say we can see, you have to trust the oracle. So if you have a cautious oracle that you trust, then you can see how to do better than it. Okay. As I say, these things really need thinking about and probably you have to stare at it for a, a few hours. But um, maybe it's just the point that you can do that kind of argument is really what I want to say here. Okay. Now, does that show that since our understanding enables us to go beyond the rules, no matter what they are, if the rules are rules we trust, we can see how to go beyond them, does that say that there is something non-computational in human thinking? And that's what I do happen to believe. I think there is something going on in our brains which is outside computation. Uh, and then, but there are various arguments that people make against this. And I want to give you basically the three arguments. This was basically Turing's argument. I said that Turing had a loophole, that he, he was well aware, at least the, the first version of this which I gave you, he was well aware of that kind of argument. But he thought that maybe we are computers, and why are we able, why does this argument not work? Well, his argument was, well, we make mistakes from time to time, and this depends on assuming that the procedures used by Human mathematicians don't involve mistakes. I don't really think that's a very convincing argument, particularly because you can make computers make mistakes if you want to. So if it's, we're better than computers because we make mistakes, why not make the computers make mistakes too? That's part of the argument, which is why I don't believe it. But the other argument is really more to the point in a way, because when you make a mistake, it's something you could potentially see is a mistake. It's, you've made a mistake, and then you go back the next day and say, oh my God, what did I do? Or somebody else say, you idiot, you've made a mistake there. Um, I mean, these mistakes are correctable. They're not sort of fundamentally in the logic that, that you, you can't do it for that reason or something. These are correctable things. So I can't quite see that. But Turing, I mean, you have to respect him. That was his reason for thinking that somehow these Arguments which I've just given you do not show that humans can, are, are not properly modelable by computation. Well, I, I happen to believe that, that, that they aren't, uh, so that I'm not accepting this argument. The two other arguments that <coughs> you can make against, or people do, are, roughly speaking, the two that are mainly made, are the extreme complication argument, that is, you see, the Algorithms governing human mathematical understanding and are so vastly complicated that their girdle statements are completely beyond reach. I don't think that's a terribly good argument. Um, I mean, you can talk about, say, going back to the um, Euclid argument, there are an infinity, uh, infinity of primes. Well, you see, the way he does it is to show that if you thought you'd had the biggest prime, you can find a bigger one. Now, that big that line number you thought you had might have been so enormously huge that you could never write it down using every proton in the universe or whatever you like, you see. <laughs> That's not part of it. It doesn't matter. The thing that, th that that number is so horrendously huge doesn't really affect the argument. Well, I'll come back to other reasons for these things too. The girdle let out is a more serious one, actually, that you don't know the algorithm. And, uh, well, let me... Just a point about Turing's statement. This was... Uh, actually a quote from Turing. It says, if a machine is expected to be infallible, it cannot also be intelligent. There are several theorems, and those are the things I was talking about here, basically, which say almost exactly that. But they say nothing about how much intelligence may be displayed if a machine makes no pretense at infallibility. So you're allowed... Well, it's, it's a mistakes argument, basically, um, which I was saying I don't terribly find myself persuaded by. Uh, what about the other two arguments? Well, these all have to do basically with something being inbuilt in our brains, which is so complicated or so sophisticated that somehow it encompasses all the mathematics 
that people can do using Gödel's theorem n times and so on. All that mathematics, in particular the um, hydro, hydro, Hercules and the Hydra argument, that the kind of reasoning that we humans can do to see that this will always work, I mean, he'll win no matter how stupid he is, um, that those arguments, how did they come about, you see? Well, I mean, how did our mathematical abilities come about? Well, how did anything come about in our thought processes? Well, it's a question of natural selection, and I'm quite happy that it is natural selection which is involved. And here I have a, a cartoon which really rather shows how implausible it is that we see here's a mathematician, and this mathematician is trying to prove some theorem, and he's about to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Whereas his cousins over here are doing all sorts of things like building mammoth traps and um, raising crops and um, taming animals and so on, this and that, and building shelters. All these things, using their understanding to develop one thing or another, they're not specifically doing anything aimed at mathematics, and certainly not the kind of sophisticated mathematics that would get beyond, say, the Hercules and the Hydra argument. So it seems to me there, it, to think that it's natural selection which has produced this kind of understanding purely as a computation is, to me, almost inconceivable. So my view is it's not that which has been selected for, it's the ability to understand. Now, it seems to me that is the crucial issue. And if you just think about what computers do, okay, that you can program to do all sorts of wonderful things, that's true. But do they understand what they're doing? Do they understand anything? I think the argument is no. Of course, one might say, well, how do we know what understanding is, and so on and so forth. Well, I think the crucial issue here is consciousness. And I'm going to, I have a picture here which is really... Well, you see, as a mathematician, I can talk about things I don't know what they mean, as long as I only interested in one implications, if you like, between them. So I don't really know what understand mean, understanding means. I'm not going to define it. Here are two other words I don't know what they mean. Intelligence, I don't know what that means either. And awareness. Consciousness, the passive version of consciousness, if you like. Just awareness. I don't know what that is either. But I would like to try and point out interconnections between these words in ordinary usage. So first of all, the word intelligence. It seems to me unreasonable to use the word intelligence for an entity if it has no understanding. So it does seem to me that whatever intelligence is, it is something that does require understanding. That's part of what intelligence involves. What about understanding? It seems to me, again, it makes it unreasonable to say of an entity that it understands something if it's not even aware of it. So whatever awareness is seems to me to be an crucial, a, a crucial ingredient of understanding. So these are the sort of statements I've been saying here. Well, it seems to me that consciousness is the crucial issue. Awareness, something, I don't know what it is, but it's something which is being used in order to understand the reasoning which takes us beyond the set of rules that we trust to the Gödel statement, the truth, I should say, of the Gödel statement of the rules, uh, the rules that we trust. And as I say, I, I flashed that thing up rather too fast, probably, for understanding to, to come in, but, but I guarantee you that, that by the use of sufficient understanding, you can follow that argument. Okay, but the, there is a question about where we draw a line, you see. I've given a mathematical statement. Well, a question came up earlier about, you know, artificial intelligence generally or mathematics. Uh, it seems to me that mathematical understanding is just one of a number of things. Um, and human understanding generally, and that's what this cartoon was about after all, the cousins of that mathematician were using their understandings in other ways, not for a mathematical problem, but in other ways in order to achieve things that they wanted. So understanding is certainly something which is valuable for, for uh, <coughs> natural selection. What about human consciousness? Well, you see, that's what I'm saying, that this is probably a crucial thing. But what about animals? You see, I don't myself draw any line between any of these things. It seems to me that uh, animal co consciousness is something present and has to have been there or we wouldn't have evolved with it from them. So what about life? Well, I don't quite know about life, but I'm saying that consciousness is the crucial thing. Now here, 
is this question now they want to raise. And I think people worry about this because they think, well, after all, our bodies and our brains are made out of the same sort of materials of other things. And after all, if you can make simulations on your computer of the behavior of objects in the physical world, why can't we do that for a brain? In which case, why don't the brains act according to computation? Well, the crucial issue here, in my mind, to my mind, is what kind of physics is actually going on and can we simulate physics computationally? Well, we certainly can do it for classical physics of particles, Newtonian particles, if you like, classical physics of fields, Maxwell's field equations, yes. Okay, there's an issue about when the continuum comes in. Computation is usually stated in terms of discrete things, natural numbers or something. What about continuum, continuous things? That is a good question. Personally, I don't believe that is the key difference. And Turing also made that argument himself. So he didn't think it was the key difference. What about quantum physics? Well, I'm going to say something about quantum physics in a minute. What about beyond quantum physics? Well, personally, I think it is beyond quantum physics that we need, I think. Let me first give you an example of something. You see, you might say, well, physics has to be computational, surely. Well, no. I'll give you an example not a realistic example, an example of a non-computable toy universe. And it's made up in the following way. It's simply made up of these things called polyominoes. These are equal-sized squares in a plane glued together in various shapes. And those shapes have to be, well, simply connected, if you like, and um, squares are all the same, and they're finite. Okay, so that's, that's the things you've got to play with. And you can consider finite sets of these things, which are these, are these various P's. I've enumerated all the finite sets. And then you construct a universe which is based on the following property or the following question. Can you use the shapes in the set to cover the plane without any gaps or not? And uh, you can easily think of shapes where you can do it. With these shapes, you can do it. These shapes individually, you can't do it, but together you can. And this shape, you can. Those are just examples. And here... There's a rather more sophisticated example using three different shapes, which, yes, you can, but it's very hard to see that you can because the shape, the way you do it, has to never repeats itself. Now, because of things like this, you can show that the problem of deciding whether or not a set of polyominoes will tile the plane is, in fact, not a computational problem. This is a theorem due to Robert Berger. He showed that there is no computer program which will decide yes or no whether a set of polyominoes will tile the plane. And from this, you can construct a non-computable universe. It's just, it, it, it consists of two things. One is the set of polyominoes, and the other is a natural number. And whether the natural number goes up or not depends on whether they will tile the plane. And the thing is that this universe, absolutely precise rules, it's very deterministic, completely precise rules, about the evolution of this universe. However, there is no computer simulation of it. So it's certainly quite possible to have a universe, if not a very realistic one, which is not computational. And my claim is that our universe is of that character. But the way in which it's of that character is something beyond the physics we know at the moment. Nevertheless, it has to be part of the physics that's used in the brain. So that's a pretty outrageous thing to say, but it is what I think. This is just telling you um, about quantum mechanics and how things can behave like particles or like waves, how they use complex numbers. The key point is that there are two operations in quantum mechanics, which I call U and R. U is basically the Schrodinger equation. It's a deterministic evolution of your state. R is what you do when you make a measurement. And they are, in, strictly speaking, inconsistent with each other. Quantum mechanics consists of these two procedures. You evolve your system according to U, and then when you make a measurement on it, you use this procedure R, which is where the probabilities come in. Okay, and a key feature of U is that it's what's called linear. Let me show you what linear means, if you don't already know. Here I have a laser, which is, has a, emits a single photon, which hits the brown thing and makes a whole lot of stuff. Okay, here I have the laser. It hits a mirror. The mirror lets it go off this way. It hits a green thing and produces another lot of stuff. Now, suppose this mirror was what's called a beam splitter or a half silver mirror. That means the photon splits its existence between these two alternatives 
and you consider that the photon has a state which is superposed between those two alternatives. And so these two things somehow happen at once. Well, Schrodinger, who knew all about his own equation, uh, showed that this causes problems because here we have the mirror and we have a cat, and the cat is okay because the mirror's there. If the mirror wasn't there, the poor cat gets killed. He did it slightly differently, but it was more or less the same thing. So we put a beam splitter between, and there we have a cat which is alive and dead at the same time. Now this is simply the evolution according to Schrodinger's own equation. You see, here's one, here's the other, and that is what his equation would say happens. He says that never happens in practice. Well, because you use the other procedure, the R procedure, someone comes along and looks at it, but then you might say, why isn't that, why isn't the measuring device, why isn't the person... Why can't you treat them, according to Schrodinger's equation, too? Then they would be in a superposition. And here we have the atmosphere in the room, that's the superposed. And here we have a person imagining the cat, and that's superposed. And why not? I won't go into all the reasons people go into this and say, well, maybe it works after all. Um, I think, as Schrodinger did, there's something missing in quantum mechanics, or as Einstein certainly did, that there is something we don't have right yet. And here I have a Schrodinger's, well, you see, it's not a cat, it's a lump. You don't really get, need to go to the length of a cat. If it goes this way, it moves the lump from one place to another. If it goes the other way, it leaves it alone. And if this lump is big enough, and there is a criterion one can write down, which depends on looking at the gravitational self-energy of the difference between these two mass, display, mass uh, configurations. Let me not go into that and you can calculate a lifetime. So what I'm saying is that quantum mechanics, at a certain level, isn't quite right. And it's at that level where the one or the other takes place. The cat is either dead or alive, according to the improved quantum mechanics that we don't yet have. Well, this is quite a subtle thing. Experiments are being performed to see whether this is true or not. At the moment, there's an experiment being performed in Leiden, and Santa Barbara in the, Leiden in the Netherlands, Santa Barbara in the United States, to try and see whether... Uh, well, let me describe the experiment. It's sim similar to what I've been saying. Here's a beam splitter, half silver of the mirror, if you like. The f single photon goes this way, split into two, and each part is kept. This one is kept for maybe a whole minute. This one goes this way. There's another mirror here, and a tiny little mirror, which is a cube, which is about a tenth of the thickness of a human hair. Tiny, you can't quite see it. If it, the photon, the photon bounces backwards and forwards, hits this thing, moves it just slightly. It moves it by about the diameter of an atomic nucleus in maybe a minute, let's say a minute. Then it comes back again, this one comes back, and you see whether this has become one or the other in the meantime. And according to the proposal I was flashing past you quickly a minute ago, the idea is that with this experiment, you would be able to tell whether that thing stayed in this superposition for up to a minute, or did it in that time spontaneously become one or the other, because of, not because of quantum mechanics, because of something beyond quantum mechanics. And I think the rules of quantum mechanics are such that they tell us that there has to be something beyond quantum mechanics. This experiment has been going on for about 11 years. I was assured that in about nine years from now, they'll have an answer to this. I don't know whether to believe them or not. Maybe, since we're having some predictions here, maybe we'll know whether quantum mechanics needs modifying or not. Okay, what's the relevance to brain? The claim is that this is actually relevant to the brain. People usually think, well, what is the brain? It consists of all these neuron things. And those things you really can't expect to preserve quantum coherence. So you're not going to explore this area of physics with simply neurons. However, neurons, there is a bit of a mystery about how the signal gets from one to the next, which is what happens in a synapse. And synapse strengths are things, there are various theories about what governs their strengths, but there's no uh, consensus, I think. One idea, which I got from Stuart Hameroff, who's an American anesthesiologist, who's interested not just in putting people to sleep, but in knowing what he's actually doing when he puts people to sleep. 
which uh, his colleagues didn't seem to be quite so interested in. Um, Okay, they want to wake them up again. They want to make sure they can do that. But what's actually going on when somebody is under a general anesthetic? And he had come to the conclusion that it's these little tubes that you find in many, in, in almost all cells, in fact, but they have a particular role to play, he argues, in neurons. And they are responsible to some degree for controlling the strengths of synapses. Now, for a long time, these ideas were thought, you know, it's pretty wild because if you want to preserve quantum coherence at the level of these tubes, you see they're, they're made out of these little proteins which are um, four by four by eight nano, nano, nanometers. And then there, they have 13 rows of these going along. It's quite an interesting structure, very crystallographic looking structure. Uh, only very recently, experiments have been performed to see whether these structures actually do support significant quantum effects. And I just want to flash that up here because these are very exciting new experiments performed by uh, an Indian chap who works in Japan called Aniban Bandyapadhyay. And he measures the uh, resistance of these microtubules and uh, the various frequencies and various temperatures and all sorts of things like this. And uh, he finds some very remarkable results. I think I'll just go to my last transparency here and quote some of these results here. What he does seem to find is very strange quantum effects. It's really, I think most physicists would say, well, you know, it's pretty hard to believe that you have things like superconductors going on in these microtubules, but still, people don't even really know properly how high-temperature superconductors work. It's, it's one of these still not properly understood areas of physics. They are not at body temperature. They're about halfway to body temperature from absolute zero. Uh, however, these microtubules, according to these um, experiments due to Bandi Apadhyay and, and his colleagues, uh, seem to have a resistance. With, if you have the right frequencies, there are certain very specific frequencies which you have to put the, um, put the voltage across the microtubules, and then you measure the resistance... And what you find is that the resistance is independent of the temperature. It goes way up to body temperature and beyond, which is quite unusual, I mean, quite extraordinary, particularly for, for a biological system, independent of the length and independent of the vibrational state. So he finds these very remarkable facts, and he seems to find some very strange kind of quantum condensate which is taking place in these microtubules. Now, I don't, have, don't really know what's going on. I don't suppose he does. It just it's an exciting new area, which does seem to show that there is something very unusual of a quantum mechanical character, which is going on at a level below the level of neurons. And the idea would be, and this is certainly Hameroff's idea, that whatever is involved in consciousness is very much tied up with these microtubules and with them out the microtubules, you wouldn't have any consciousness. And that, in fact, they are sort of, in general anesthetics, they are inactivated by, by, the, by the chemicals that you uh, have to breathe in order to uh, uh, put yourself unconscious. Anyway, I'll just leave you with that, because I think these are exciting uh, things. They're not exactly mathematics, but uh, they do relate to mathematical ideas, or very deep ones, such as the Gödel theorem and the very notion of computation and so on, which uh, I think are very important ingredients into trying to understand what understanding itself actually is. And maybe ultimately we'll have come to that kind of understanding and to see if this is something beyond what at least a computer in the sense that we presently understand that notion is something which we actually are able to go beyond in our conscious thinking. Thank you very much. I'm quite interested by the idea of um, how those microtubules and the quantum effects in them co um, create the feeling of consciousness. Um, would you say that in that case, by implementing those quantum effects um, in artificial intelligence devices, um, could you create artificial consciousness in computers and um, such things like that? Yes, I think what I'm saying is that 
you wouldn't have artificial consciousness in a computer as we understand that term now, which does mean a basically a Turing machine. That you might have a device, if you knew really what was going on here, which would involve this beyond quantum mechanics idea, you could imagine having some kind of device which maybe in the remote future people would see, you know, be some latter-day Frankenstein who would actually be able to incorporate that into some conscious entity. But it seems to me that we're so far away from that at the moment that it's very difficult to speculate about such things. I'm not saying it couldn't be done. I'm not saying that you couldn't, in the lab, create some entity which had consciousness. Of course, if you did that, there are all sorts of moral problems that you'd run up with, which I don't think people seem to worry about with computers. It always struck me as odd that when people talk about you know, sending things out into space or into volcanoes or goodness knows where, you wouldn't want to send a conscious being, particularly out to space, where you say, well, we don't need to bother to take that thing back because it's using its own artificial intelligence to do the exploration. Now, if that, that entity was actually conscious, you'd have a moral responsibility to bring the thing back home. And so it raises all sorts of questions. So I'm jolly glad these things are far in the future and not the kind of problem that we're really going to have to address. I'm not sure I answered your question. I couldn't hear you terribly well. I hope it did address some of the things you were saying. I was just asking whether you think it was possible. And did I think it's possible? Yeah. Whether, like, whether that, what you're saying about it, what do you think that in theory... You mean artificial consciousness is what you're saying? Yes. Whether, whether that would be sufficient for it. Or well, you see, be... it's, I mean, I, I, I suppose I do think it's possible, but <laughs> we're nowhere close because we don't under, even understand the physics, you see. We don't know, we don't have the physical theory, I'm claiming. If it's, if it's along the lines I'm saying, then we don't have the physics yet, let alone how you would incorporate that physics into something. It wouldn't just be making use of the state reduction, you see, because that's happening all the, all the time in some random way. It has to be organized in some way. So there's a lot, enormous amount that we don't understand. And it's not that it's just around the corner. And it's not that we could do it on a computer. So that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, just want to ask, why would those uh, effects develop in the brain during the process of evolution? Where would they appear from during the evolution? Evolution, yes. No, well, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, my view would be, since you've got to get to a certain level, I mean, microtubules and these things, or many of these structures exist way down in, in evolution. I mean, you, you have them in, in plants, so it's not just animals even. So what my view would be that there is a lot of quantum activity taking place which is very beneficial to organisms. And that somehow back, way back in evolution, uh, these organisms found it useful to take advantage of quantum effects. Now, this is not what I'm talking about here, because I'm talking of that quantum, those quantum molecules building up to a certain level where you start to see where quantum mechanics itself needs, you need to probe the boundary between quantum mechanics and, and the classical world. Now, that, you can't get to that boundary unless you've already had quantum effects being useful in evolution. So I think they must already be extremely useful to all sorts of creatures way below what we experienced before, before mammals, probably one-celled one animals, I'm pretty sure. They must be taking advantage of some of these quantum coherent effects. But it's only much later, and people are discovering things like this already in biology now. It's known that photosynthesis uses quantum entanglements effects, quite subtle effects of quantum mechanics. And I believe there's something else I, more recently, which I, I forget what it was now. But there are discovering subtle quantum effects being of relevant. I, I should say subtle effects other than the ones we already know. Chemistry, after all. Qu chemistry is quantum, is already quantum effects. We got so used to that that we don't think of that as particularly uh, quantum. But I mean, of course it is. So that at higher and higher levels, yes, it will be taken advantage of. And then finally, according to what I'm saying, you get to this level where you need to go beyond quantum mechanics to whatever this new scheme is, and that's where you start to find a role for consciousness. I believe it's way below human beings. I think consciousness is, is down there in many other animals. I don't think it's just us. It's okay, particularly sophisticated with human beings. But not yeah, if you're saying that the, the brain is capable of doing things that theoretical computers aren't able to do, for example, understanding, then are you saying the 
potential of the physical world, as in the limits of what it can, can produce and do, is more than the theoretical? It's more than computational. So I think I'd like to draw a clear distinction here. Um, we mustn't confuse computation with mathematical, if you like. I mean, you can have a very good mathematical... In, in, in a sense, that example of my, my rather silly uh, toy model is showing you that you can have a model which is non-computational, which is quite clear. You can say it's to do with these polynomials, will they tile the plane or not, and that is a very clear-cut mathematical statement. So it's clearly a mathematical toy universe, but it's not a computational one. There is no computational simulation of that universe. So I'm saying that our universe, although not in detail like that, I certainly wouldn't think that, but is of that character. That's what I'm trying to say. That there is something still mathematical going on, that there, that there are laws which I would still believe to be understandable in mathematical terms, but which are not computational. And there's an awful lot of mathematics which is not computational. It's, it's the sort of thing, when, when you play around with computers and get used to them and they're so common in the world, you get to think that, oh, well, everything has to be computational. But I'm saying, no, that's not true. And we know in mathematics it's not true. Whether it's actually true and not true in physics, too, is what I'm trying to say here. But that's, uh, some people regard that as an outrageous statement, but okay. If you can uh, please ca clarify a matter of terminology. When you say non-computational, you, do, do you mean something that doesn't compute or you mean something that cannot be simulated by a Turing machine, strictly speaking? I know people sometimes make this distinction. I can't understand it myself. I mean, you say, does nature compute? You say, well, I don't know what that means, you see. If you, if you mean, can you simulate nature by computation, then I do understand what well, that means. I, I, but by compute more generally, I mean, you ask it a question and it gives you back an answer, but you don't know what's going on inside the box. Sure, yeah. Well, I'm saying more than that. You see, I'm saying that it's not that we don't know what's going on. It's that that part of quantum, that not understood borderline between quantum mechanics and classical physics, which is where you bring in that R procedure, where you bring in the measurement procedure, which is to me a stopgap. You can't understand that procedure in terms of the equations of Schrodinger, which should be governing the way the world works. It's different. And you have to introduce it in order to make quantum mechanics agree with macroscopic observations that we make on quantum systems. And so there is this gap, which I believe to be a genuine, non-understood gap in physics. And I also believe, that's what I'm trying to say, is that that is the only plausible place that there could be a non-computational action in, that, that we are taking advantage of. So I say that the conscious brain is taking advantage of that part of physics that we don't yet understand, but that we presumably will understand someday. So I'm not saying it's outside physics. I'm not saying it's some mystical thing which we'll never understand. I'm saying it is part of physics. It's not part of present-day physics. Um, <clears throat> it just seems to me that if we compare uh, the range of um, behaviors you get in computers, so you know, we're, we're aware that computers with good programming can be made appear more and more intelligent. Yeah. And, I mean, there are lots of computers out there that do that. And, and also, if we take humans, we're also aware that there's a big spectrum of abilities there. So some people are cleverer than others, and, and some people have mental illnesses like uh, learning difficulties sure. or other kinds of um, things. So it seems to me that there's two spectra, and um, clearly they overlap. If you, if you sort of look at it like that. Uh, and yet you're saying there's a kind of qualitative uh, difference between the two. Um, and I just wonder kind of how much, how much wider or more fuzzy would these spectra have to be before you would be convinced that, um, that you know, that, that qualitative difference is not so uh, significant or, or maybe isn't there at all? Uh, let me first say that I wouldn't say that human beings behave non... I mean, I think a lot of what we do is computational. So I don't know if that, was, that wasn't really a question, but let me make that point. And, and, and certainly there are different parts of the brain. Uh, the cerebellum seems to be something which is pretty well unconscious. And that's what, you know, when you... Even you can be 
performing some very complicated musical composition or something. Um, that level of the mechanical stuff which you've programmed into yourself, if you like, okay, that is computational because presumably it's something which is done by the cerebellum largely and which doesn't involve consciousness. So what I'm saying, only the only difference is where you bring your consciousness in. A lot of what human beings do is presumably very much computational. And I'm not trying to say it's completely different. Um, it's, and certainly I agree with you that there are, level, there are de- levels of degree and so on and so forth. But I do think that there is a qualitative difference when it comes to consciousness. Now, it's very hard to make that rigorous because we don't really know what it is. Now, as I said, I didn't know what it is. But it's something that each one of us is very much... I, use, I hate to say the word conscious of or aware of because that's circular. But nevertheless, we all know what it means to ourselves. But what it means, in a sense, to formalize as some physical process or something, all we can do is look for uh, something in the future where these things become clearer. But I do believe that it's something conscious, a conscious process and an unconscious process are crucially different. And the, the, to, the quality that we have, and when I say we, I'm including animals, not just human beings, is something which... Uh, is not something possessed by c- computers in our sense of that term as we use it now. Because these are purely computational actions which I don't regard as things which... But for the kind of... The only thing I can, I can actually get my hands on are the girdle thing, if you like. That's the only clear argument which seems to me to show you that there is, by the use of one's conscious understanding one can see something which any pre-assigned computational procedure cannot get. So there is something which is revealing, it is revealing something of a distinction. But it's very slippery, and how you can make this distinction clear, I agree, is, is very hard. I just think there is a distinction. And that the computers, no matter how sophisticated they are, if they are just computers in the sense of Turing machines or something like that, then they're not going to be conscious. Now, this is my position, and some people have very different positions on this. As I was saying to an earlier question, to hold a different position on that lands you down a pretty slippery slope when you're trying to... You know, if you think your device has consciousness, it has, you have moral responsibilities to it. And this is a question which would ultimately arise if these things did possess consciousness. <laughs>